two years ago, uh, I was a PhD student with Andy Warfield at University of British Columbia. We'd been doing um, virtualization research for a long time, and we started playing around with uh, fast flash, like a lot of people here did a, a couple years ago. Um, and a light bulb went off in our heads that uh, there actually was a way that these two things kind of complemented each other. We uh, got a bit of startup fever, and two years later, we had uh, uh, the product that I'm about to describe to you, uh, Strata, which is basically a, an enterprise storage system that's designed to make um, full use, take full advantage of very fast, uh, non-volatile memory. Um, and uh, this has obviously been an extremely hot topic, uh, the f flash, but this particular talk is a l maybe a little bit different because it is not uh, strictly a research talk. This is about uh, the way we had to uh, use flash uh, so that we could provide this to uh, existing uh, storage uh, uh, array customers, uh, and this introduces a bunch of new constraints that you wouldn't fi find if you were trying to, um, if you had total control over not only how you uh, manage the storage, but how you had clients use it. Uh, so in particular, the system we were built, our first target was to uh, be able to replace the storage that uh, uh, large VMware installations would use. And this means we were constrained uh, in the kind of protocol that we could provide the storage with. Uh, these systems, the best fit for us that, was, that VMware understands is uh, actually NFS v3. This is a very old protocol. It is not a particularly scalable protocol by nature. Uh, clients, this is built back in the days when disks were very slow, and clients expect to be able to talk to a single server over a single IP address. So this introduced some interesting constraints uh, in building the system. Uh, and then another constraint that uh, is introduced to our system, because it's an industrial rather than a research product, it was very important for us to be able to kind of keep the cost of flash in mind, uh, and uh, in particular be able to add flash to our system uh, as, uh, as over the lifetime of the system as people's needs grew. Uh, so flash is expensive, it's getting cheaper, but the fact that it's getting cheaper all the time means you don't want to buy it until uh, you really need it. And so the, those are our two kind of industrial constraints. One, how do we get this flash into the hands of uh, your standard enterprise customers that can only speak uh, protocols like NFS v3? And uh, two, how do we manage the flash so that you can dynamically add it at the last second? Uh, and the uh, result of that work is a system that we've been building for two years with lots of engineering effort. At, uh, uh, the high-level point I'll make about it is the architecture that we've come up with seems to scale pretty well. We've gotten uh, more than a million IOPS uh, out of these uh, flash cards in a relatively small deployment, about 13U of rack space, uh, representing uh, 12 nodes. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we did that now. The first slide is probably one you've seen a million times before. It bears repeating. Uh, flash is a lot faster than any other uh, stores that we've kind of had to deal with before. Um, the card on the bottom there is an Intel 910. That's uh, the, kind of the card that we're shipping with in our product right now. And it is a 1,000 times faster than a very fast magnetic disk. I'll point out that this is not as fast as Flash gets. The cards next year are going to be twice as fast. And there is stuff that's uh, even faster than that. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, pretty uh, challenging to drive uh, quickly. You can't, for instance, just take a standard storage array, like, like this one here that might have 24 disks, and replace the disk with flashcards and expect to get any kind of useful performance out of the thing. An array like this uh, would, might produce something like 4,200 IOPS. If you theoretically were able to replace them with flash devices, you would be um, theoretically able to get 4.2 million IOPS, and that is physically impossible to get out of a uh, a system like this. A 10 gigabit NIC, if you give it 4K requests, is going to get about 300,000 IOPS. So you're, you're clearly bottlenecked quite heavily at, uh, past the flash in a, in a monolithic array. Uh, and so this drives you into looking for a, uh, <clears throat> an architecture that lets you, uh, that's more, a little bit more distributed, where you can uh, pair your flash devices with uh, NICs uh, and, and spread that load out. And furthermore, these devices actually, they're running so fast that they consume a lot of CPU to, to uh, drive effectively. Um, <clears throat> so they, these things will, just shipping data back and forth will, will, will peg uh, uh, fast CPU uh, cores. And if you're trying to do anything interesting along the data path, you'll need even, even more. So it's important that we have, we balance the uh, flash resources with uh, both CPU and network in order to keep from being uh, bottlenecked uh, artificially in the system. Uh, one approach you might take, the kind of simple, naive approach that we have seen as Flash first started to come out, what might be to just put flash cards on client machines. I think there are some uh, obvious limitations there. First of all, I uh, mentioned Flash is a, actually still a pretty expensive resource. 
these cards, these Intel 910s are, last I checked in the area, about $4,000, uh, which makes them compare in price to the servers themselves. Uh, and so if you are not keeping your flash cards uh, busy, that's uh, <coughs> fairly expensive uh, uh, resources that you're wasting. Uh, the problem with have putting a flash card on a host is that you don't have a lot of client traffic in order to, to keep that thing fully busy. You're going to have to make tough choices about either starving clients of bandwidth or wasting uh, idle, idle resources on your cards, uh, which is uh, economically a problem. If you try to do, think, be a little bit more clever and um, tie um, your cards together in a network and have them be able to offload uh, client load from one machine onto a card and another, you can, you can do this, but it, you quickly run into all kinds of other problems with uh, having to depend on uh, client networks that uh, may or may not be fast enough or uh, having to compete for CPU resources with the clients on your host. So the more intensive your, your guests are, the harder you're going to drive the card and uh, uh, you have uh, isolation problems. So we didn't, and furthermore, you, you have the problem of having your, uh, the amount of storage you have kind of have to be symmetric with the amount of compute you have and often the needs are very different. So uh, we thought we sh it's important to be able to have the uh, benefits of a storage uh, array uh, you know, being able to keep those two things separate and isolated uh, and well balanced, um, but not have the problem of a storage array, which is a kind of a, a bottle, controller bottleneck. So thinking about this, the, uh, this led us to uh, basically three architectural uh, questions that we wanted to answer uh, to figure out how to drive this fa uh, flash efficiently. And these three questions are, our answers to these three questions are kind of how the rest of the talk is going to uh, go. Um, I'll start out by uh, dealing with the problem of how can we take a single flash device and efficiently share it among a lot of different clients so that we can keep uh, the utilization high on the card and not waste cycles uh, with coordinating between the different clients. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we'd like to be able to take a, a large number of cards and pool them together into a single aggregate uh, so that we get even uh, better utilization through uh, numbers and uh, uh, also so that we can do, uh, clients can do things uh, when they can spread across cards that they couldn't do if they only had one card avail available to them, like uh, replication or erasure coding and so on. And finally, once we've built a system that theoretically lets us manage the storage in a really nice way, we have to figure out how to get that into the hands of um, uh, uh, clients that only know how to talk legacy storage protocols, uh, like NFSv3 or iSCSI. And so the rest of the talk is going to be about how our answers to that question, but first I'll give you a, a, just a kind of a more concrete picture of the uh, uh, of what we, we ship um, so, that the arch so that the abstract architecture makes a bit more sense. Um, so I mentioned before that we, we are uh, trying to balance the amount of CPU and network we have with the flash resources. The way we do that is we bundle a couple of flash cards with two 10 gigabit NICs and two Xeon processors and two small servers that we're calling microarrays, and we sell these a pair at a time for, uh, for fault tolerance, and you can kind of add these to your system as you go. On top of these uh, microarrays, we also provide a 10 gigabit uh, SDN-enabled switch uh, to tie them together and to provide the uh, storage to clients. And the reason we uh, ship a switch, aside from being able to make sure that we have good resource isolation, is that it is SDN-enabled, and uh, which means that we have control over, tight control over how packets are forwarded between uh, ports. And this is the key to the uh, um, problem of legacy storage protocols that I'll talk about towards the end of the talk. Uh, I'll also mention at this point that the, uh, we do ship uh, along with these, uh, with Flash, each of these microarrays has uh, a large number of disk, disk uh, magnetic disks behind it. Uh, and then we tier to that so the data that isn't doesn't need to be accessed as fast or, or a little bit colder, uh, can, has a place to go more cheaply. But I'm not going to talk about that in, the, in this talk. That's not the uh, <coughs> point of this uh, architecture. So I will uh, start with uh, question one, which is how can we efficiently share a single flash device? And since uh, most of the team at Coho Data has background at Zen, some of them are the people, the original authors of Zen, this looked to us like a virtualization problem. The lesson that we learned a decade ago in server virtualization is that the nice way to, to share resources is to design an interface to a physical device that looks, uh, resembles that physical device, but is uh, uh, simplified. Uh, you want it to look like a physical device because that means it's cheap to implement uh, as an abstraction layer, uh, and you want it to be simplified so that the things that are talking to that interface don't have to have any knowledge about the uh, physical specifics of that device. They don't need to know about, in the storage case, 
where, where their blocks live versus other blocks. This reduces the coordination problem and lets you do things like migrate uh, clients from one device to another. So concretely, uh, what a, um, uh, we do to the device is we, we provide a layer that uh, lets the clients interact with the device over uh, using sparse virtual address spaces. This is an interface that kind of resembles a, a, an OSD interface. It's a, a bit simpler and it has a couple other wrinkles, but it's the basic idea is that clients uh, get themselves a, an object name and then they can write to it or read, read from it at byte granularity across an arbitrary uh, range in that object uh, up to 64-bit uh, offsets. Um, and uh, the object is ma maintained sparsely on disk, so the client doesn't have to think about where the data physically is in the file. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we also provide an interface for resync between uh, if we have an object that's replicated across two flash devices, the, the file system at this level uh, is responsible for figuring out how to get uh, changes from one to another if one was temporarily offline. And the reason I mention that is because the, one of the crucial things about this layer is that uh, we are able to change the underlying file system without having to change the uh, clients on top of it. So we have spent uh, a lot of effort, engineering effort, building our own log structured file system that's uh, aware of what, uh, uh, of the flash that it's managing. It tries to think about, you know, batching data for uh, right, uh, right size blocks and garbage collecting and erase size blocks and so on. Uh, and we try to make this as efficient as we can. Um, but any cycles that we spend at this layer of the stack are going to be paid for by every application. Uh, so it's important for us to keep those uh, cycles down uh, as much as possible. And the hardware underneath that we're driving is changing quite quickly, and the assumptions that we've made about what that hardware needs are also changing. The firmware on these flashcards is getting smarter, and we're having to worry less and less about uh, that kind of batching and treat them more and more as random access devices. Uh, and in the future, we might want to replace the thing wholesale with, uh, say, for instance, RAM became cheap, and you could keep your, all of your data stored in RAM, and you might want to replace uh, our file system with something with a really clever uh, garbage collector. Uh, instead, this kind of interface would let you uh, do that. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about uh, device. It's a pretty st device virtualization. It looks a lot like uh, the kind of virtualization we've done in the past at the server level. Uh, but uh, once we have the ability to uh, multiplex clients onto devices, we'd also like to collect these devices into a uh, pool and, and not just be able to share uh, Move, move clients freely between those devices, but able, be able to do more interesting operations when we can combine uh, devices together. And we have an abstraction for that called uh, data pads that lets us do all kinds of things with a pool of devices that, uh, beyond just uh, um, multiplying out the load. Uh, so uh, here's your starting point. You have one card. You have multiple clients on it. What kinds of things would you want to do if you had more than one device? Um, oops. First thing you might want to do is move a uh, client from one device to another for load balancing. It's a fairly straightforward uh, task. Uh, another thing you might want to do is you might want to uh, keep your data, some, some objects are replicated, maybe replicated more than once uh, if, they, uh, if they were worth it. If they were, uh, and uh, you might want to stripe your data across cards uh, for load balancing purposes. You might decide that some objects were better erasure coded than replicated if they uh, that you, want, you value the redundancy, but you didn't want to pay the storage costs for those objects. You can make all kinds of trade-offs. And the uh, important uh, point to note about these objects is once you have a large pool of objects and a large pool of flashcards, you can't assume that the uh, workloads or the objects are, are uh, homogeneous. You want them to be able to do, uh, have different kinds of storage policies for each, each object in order to make the best use of the system. We don't have a one-size-fits-all. You, you replicate twice. You stripe four ways. That's not going to work. And so the way we handle this is we, uh, instead of uh, having a fixed uh, dispatch process from receiving a client request over NFS to uh, s splitting that up into uh, cards, we, we, let, we have a description of each uh, um, object in a shared database that represents a kind of graph of processing. Uh, we, we provide a library where, uh, uh, of processing elements where each, each processing element does a simple job, like taking a request and splitting it across stripe boundaries or replicating it or erasure coding it. And then the object is uh, described in our database as a, as a graph of these. Uh, this resembles a lot um, something in the networking world called a click. Uh, it's a little bit different because instead of just being a forwarding path, it's actually a, a request response path. But it is the same basic idea where you have a, a library of processors. And it can be efficient because 
these are uh, just function calls. Uh, so when a uh, node wants to open a file, it looks up the graph and it builds, them, builds that uh, kind of chain of function calls in a single process. This doesn't represent RPC or anything like that. And the last point I'll make about this path is that uh, when a client uh, opens an object and instantiates this graph, it also registers itself in the system as having the file open. And what this enables you to do is to change the data path of, a, uh, of an object while that object is being used. Clients continue to send I.O. to it, and under the feed of those clients, you might uh, replace a store or uh, uh, add a new store and move, move where the data actually lives. Uh, and this is key to being able to uh, add capacity to a, to a system uh, as it's live. Uh, uh, with, and uh, I will show you how that works on the next slide. One of the key engines of our system is the rebalancer. Uh, so uh, if you have a two-node system, and you order two more nodes because you need the extra capacity. You plug them into your rack and turn them on. Uh, the system will immediately notice that, and this will trigger a our rebalancer process. Uh, what that does is it uh, does an inventory of all of the objects in the system, and then tries to figure out the best place for each object over the over all of the stores. It's not just where they live now, but where they could live. Uh, uh, and this factors in things like the capacity of the nodes, uh, the uh, layout of each of the objects, and the um, uh, fault domains, what kind of fault tolerance we're, we, we expect these nodes to have. This is an online constraint satisfaction problem. Once it uh, comes up with a solution uh, to this problem, it formulates a plan uh, for it, uh, and then it communicates with all of the, it changes the data paths in the system, including uh, updating the data paths of any clients that have objects open. So this can all happen online. Uh, and uh, the result of the uh, plan is that we will create new replicas for objects on new stores and then uh, begin to use the resync interface I mentioned before to copy data from the old location to the new location as the uh, objects are in use. This will, when this completes, uh, we can reap the old locations. And now we have a layout that is optimal uh, for the, or close to optimal for the uh, new topology without ever having to have any kind of service interruption. OK, so that is uh, kind of, at this point, we have a uh, big pool of Flash. We can do all kinds of per-object uh, customization with it uh, using our data path interface. The uh, last thing we need to do is to be able to glue all of the, uh, glue, glue that cool new uh, Flash interface into existing uh, uh, enterprise uh, storage environments talking legacy protocols. Uh, we've targeted NFS v3. This applies uh, equally well to iSCSI, although we're using NFS right now. Um, and the way we do this, as I mentioned, is uh, with something that we're calling protocol virtualization. And what this involves is us uh, having control over the switch that connects the clients and the servers uh, so that clients can think that they're talking to a, a single server, a single IP address. But behind the scenes, we can, we can coordinate between the switch and our distributed array of nodes to have uh, traffic go uh, be load balanced and go uh, uh, be load balanced across the entire uh, cluster. So this relies on uh, switch being SDN enabled. In particular, we're controlling our switch with OpenFlow. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of a background for, uh, for that since this, uh, some of you may not be familiar with it. Uh, in a regular switch, uh, its job is to forward packets. And the way it does that is kind of baked into the firmware of the switch. Uh, it'll, uh, what packet comes in, it'll maybe look at the destination MAC address know by uh, sniffing traffic which port that MAC address belongs in, and, and, uh, and just forward it, uh, forward it there, and, that, and that's the end of the story. It might route or something, but it's kind of out of your control. Uh, in an open flow uh, switch, you have much better control over uh, how packets are forwarded. You can uh, write rules that match various parts of an incoming packet and explicitly state, based on these filters, which, uh, which port receives the packets as they come in on. And what this means we can do, we can do a lot of things with this. One of the things we can do with it is kind of load balance uh, uh, NFS without requiring any kind of changes in the client. Uh, so in our system, we uh, can actually, conf here's, a, here's a networked uh, picture of our system. Uh, the red lines are our standard uh, VLAN that the nodes use to talk to each other to do things like do read requests from each other's uh, flashcards. The green line is the interesting one. This is an open flow controlled network between the clients and the servers. This is what NFS traffic goes over. And uh, the thing to note here, uh, one of the things to note here is that all of, the, all of our nodes use the same, are configured on that interface with the exact same IP address and, and even the same MAC address. This is something you're not supposed to do in a regular network, but you can do if you have an open flow enabled switch. Um, 
uh, because you control, the, the MAC address doesn't determine which port uh, the traffic goes to. And the benefit of this is that clients, no matter which uh, node a client is talking to, it looks like it's talking to, it, uh, it looks like the same one it was talking to before. You can move a client from one node to another and it will not realize that anything has changed. And you can do this without having to do any kind of packet rewriting, which would be very expensive on a, on a fast path like this. Uh, so to uh, walk through uh, what's happening here, uh, if, uh, when a client wants to open up a connection to N the NFS server, that will result in a, uh, a SYN packet being uh, sent from the client o over to the switch. The switch knows that this network is a, uh, this port is an open flow controlled port and will look for a, a rule in the open flow table telling it where to send the packet. If there isn't a rule, this uh, packet will get forwarded to an open flow controller. In our case, this is an uh, open flow controller we've written from scratch that uh, understands our uh, network. It, it can do things like monitor load on our NFS servers and figure out what the best place to uh, uh, assign that client is uh, based on a, a several factors. <coughs> when it's made that decision, it will write an open flow uh, rule that will assign the client to a particular server. And then it will take the packet that it got and re-inject it into the switch. The switch now uh, has a rule that tells it where to forward it, that, that packet. Uh, and uh, we now have an, a connection established normally between a client and a particular server. Uh, this allows us to distribute the load uh, on clients uh, when they connect. You can actually also move clients um, between servers depending on load uh, without having to uh, um, reconnect to the server. The, we, we take some advantage of the fact that NFS is by nature a stateless protocol. So in, in theory, all you would have to do is move a client from one server to another. The TCP stack would not know the connection. It would send a reset and the client would reconnect automatically. It will basically look like the, the server was rebooted. But in practice, if you're migrating frequently, you have to deal with a couple of wrinkles uh, in NFS. Uh, for instance, some NFS operations are not idempotent, uh, like uh, create a file or remove a file. Uh, the first time you send that operation down, it will succeed under good circumstances, but if you sent that request a second time, it would fail because, say, the file already existed. Um, and that would be a bad thing to send back to the client. So what, the way we handle that is the open, because we have control over the uh, open flow controller process, we can, it can coordinate with the servers, drain any kind of pending request queue before it does a migration. And there are lots of other things we can do with OpenFlow uh, that I uh, will not get into to, uh, now. Uh, things like uh, we can take advantage of the fact that we have control of the switch to, do, to fence off misbehaving nodes, which is a nice thing to be able to do in a distributed system. And, and uh, we can also do all kinds of uh, network optimizations, uh, which we'll maybe talk about in future work. Um, OK. So that is kind of the architecture that we have from the top to the bottom. Uh, now, how does it work once we uh, put it all together? To evaluate uh, all the, we can evaluate all the pieces uh, that I've described uh, kind of in a single uh, basic experiment design. In this uh, next couple of experiments, uh, what we've done is we've set up a large test lab with uh, one switch. This is a 48 port 10 gig switch. The top half of the switch gets uh, 12 ESX hosts, each of which have two NICs. So we're using 24 ports of client traffic. And the bottom half of the host, we're going to plug storage in, starting with uh, two arrays, uh, two microarrays. That means uh, four 10 gigabit NICs. And working all the way up to, to uh, tw uh, 12 arrays, so 24 ports. In other words, using the full capacity of the switch, all 480 gigabits of, of bandwidth. Uh, so we're going to add two nodes, start with only two no all the clients attached to, to two nodes. And then as, uh, the, uh, as they run doing I.O., we're going to add two more nodes. And, and you can see the. Um, uh, load spread evenly and the bandwidth and performance of the system growing as the nodes are added. In the uh, first experiment, uh, what we have is a, uh, a workload that is meant to look kind of like a, what a real workload looks like. It's going to be a mix of reads and writes, 80-20 uh, read-write, uh, and the request size are going to be kind of medium, 64 to 128K. The big difference between this and uh, an actual deployment is that all of the VMs in our system are running the same workload. They're just r pushing things as hard as they can with this, with this mix of requests. Um, so uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, we get uh, about uh, 10 gigabytes a second of bandwidth, or 100-ish gigabits, uh, uh, with a full deployment. Um, and you can see uh, as it works, uh, at, uh, we, we start out with two nodes. And when we, we add a couple of nodes, the uh, Recent, the rebalance process begins to migrate data off of the two loaded nodes. Half of the data gets moved onto the empty nodes. And when that process completes, uh, uh, the, and, the, and as that happens, when the two nodes come online, the, the uh, clients, the NFS clients, are also migrated to use them as NFS servers. 
And so when that process completes, we instantly have more bandwidth than the uh, process repeats at, at each of these steps. You'll maybe notice a couple of things about this graph. Uh, one of them is that there is a uh, dip in bandwidth when you first add uh, a new set of nodes. And this is uh, simply because the flashcards that were previously only serving client requests now have to compete between uh, uh, serving client requests for I.O. and also uh, shipping their data uh, across to the new nodes. So there's a bit of a dip while that's happening. The, the amount of time that, that we spend in that phase where we're copying data onto the new nodes gets shorter and shorter as we have bigger and bigger clusters because we have more uh, source nodes to spread that load out across. Uh, and you might also notice that the graph doesn't look purely linear. Uh, there are several reasons for this, uh, but one of them is simply the fact that as we have uh, more and more uh, nodes in the system, the likelihood that a client doing some random request on a random object is going to get a local copy of it shrinks. And uh, if a node has to do a remote uh, I.O. on behalf of a client that is going to cost cost more. So the more cl more nodes you have, if you have a random distribution of clients and uh, and, and objects, the more uh, more uh, remote I.O. you're going to have to do. So we actually, the, our, the, one of the nice things about our system is that the, this uh, is not, we don't have a fixed uh, random load balancer that you have to use. You can also, if you want, control uh, how objects are placed on the system so that it's not randomly distributed and you can control how clients are, are, are uh, assigned to, as well to kind of improve locality. And this second slide here, we have a, uh, a random, uh, we have an, a slide that we're, where the workload we've designed is not to kind of stress the system uh, as much as possible, but more to produce the, the maximum number of IOPS that we can, we can get out of it. And the so way we did that was we used small requests, 4K, and we made them reads, uh, since those are much cheaper. And we also uh, applied, a, we took manual control over the placement. We took advantage of the fact that this is a homogenous workload so that we could fix um, uh, as we added nodes, we would, we would, we would assign uh, data, data from in the system to the new nodes on, a, on an ESX client by ESX client basis and then migrate the client connections to, the, uh, to those nodes um, so, that they were, so that all data accesses were local. And in this case, you get something that's a lot closer to linear scalability. The graph isn't perfectly linear because we uh, have a little uh, modulo effect from the fact that if you have... Uh, 12, 12 clients and 10 hosts, you, 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 you're going to get an imbalance when you, when you round robin the, the clients around. But the end result, we start out with a, something under 200,000 IOPS and we get over 1.1 million uh, as we multiply the uh, capacity by six. The last little uh, tidbit I'll mention before I conclude is, uh, as I said before, the CPU usage is extremely uh, uh, high on, on a system with this kind of flash. That top line there the, uh, is the E52620, which is what we uh, bought for our test lab before we finished developing our system. And it was based on uh, how much CPU we, we burned to drive a, a device flat out. We didn't really factor in the fact that we have to also do lots of stuff in software besides that, like um, NFS and RPC and uh, file system work. Uh, it turns out that once you do all that, we actually are a, a CPU bound in our own system. The one that we are shipping is the third one down. And you can see uh, on, uh, we get about a 48% improvement in IOPS uh, on the CPU. The graphs that we looked at on the previous slide are all using the slow hardware in our test bed, so we think that what we're shipping is actually uh, already uh, quite a bit faster. I'll just conclude now uh, with uh, pointing out that, uh, that we were able to get Flash into our, uh, the hands of enterprise customers with three basic techniques, uh, device virtualization uh, to share, the, share devices across clients, data paths to let them uh, um, do all kinds of uh, heterogeneous workloads across a pool of uh, devices and protocol virtualization to let the um, <coughs> legacy protocols take full advantage of our scalable system. And uh, we're hiring in Vancouver. It's a lovely place to work. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Umesh Maishuri. I'm from Nimble Storage. I'm wondering why um, you have to forward requests between nodes uh, in the cluster. Uh, you know, couldn't you, uh, using your OpenFlow controller, always map the connection to a node that holds the object? Uh, well, the thing is, not all data lives on all flashcards. Uh, you, if you've spread it around, and the, uh, you know, for instance, you've striped your data, uh, some clients are going, some parts of their data are going to live on. Are just not going to be on the client. You, you can, um, and you can't move the client to the at the fre frequency of a per request, uh, which is what you have to do, I think, to make sure that you always had a, a local read. 
Really? I mean, maybe you could uh, uh, do more advanced uh, tricks than we're doing right now with OpenFlow to, to do that. Actually, we're, we're investigating some of these more low-level tricks, but with a, with a basic just client migration protocol, that would be too expensive. You'd be resetting the session all the time and, and not be able to do it. In, in theory, if you could uh, um, do something fancier than just migrating client and letting the TCP stack reset, like you could carry TCP state with you, you, you could improve locality, and we, we are looking at how to do that. If that's what you mean. Okay. All right. Thanks. Hi. Uh, New York Stolia Mush. Uh, New York Stolia Imaginetics. Um, so I'm curious, right? So in your system, assuming I have two clients connected to two different microarrays, right? You talked about virtualization workloads, but there's something that's a little bit more general purpose, right? Say I have write write or read write sharing on the same object, mm -hmm. right? Do your microarrays all talk in the background to figure it out, or it just not, doesn't really work today? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned before, when a client opens a file, uh, mm -hmm. it uh, registers itself as having that file open. Uh, okay. And that works uh, basically to prevent write conflicts, but mm -hmm. it means that when another client wants to do a write to the same object, it ends up stealing the token, uh, and they bounce back and forth. So today, the, the system is definitely optimized for a kind of single writer workload, okay. although multiple readers are fine uh, okay. because they get forwarded to the right place. But we are... Uh, we are working on that. I'm making the thing a general purpose NFS file okay. server. We'll change that. We'll change those semantics. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Great. Let's thank the speaker again.